Hello and welcome. My name is Brant Rumble, Editorial Director at Hachette Books, and I'm here to host our author, Kenny Loggins, and to celebrate the publication of his book, Still All Right, a memoir by Kenny Loggins. Uh, you know Kenny from so many things. Uh, Loggins and Messina, of course. Uh, as one of the uh, forefathers, uh, godfathers of Yacht Rock. Uh, they're saying that. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, for the soundtracks, Caddyshack, Footloose, Top Gun, Over the Top, the list goes on. And then uh, we found out uh, when we first brought this project to the table at Hachette from many of our younger employees, uh, they know you from the children's music. All so right. we are, we're talking about five decades of just wonderful uh, performing, recording, writing, producing, uh, and I'm excited, could not be more thrilled to introduce my author, Kenny Loggins. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Do you believe we were here? We're finally here. It is amazing. I mean, we have, uh, so we've been working on this for a couple of years, essentially. At least. Well, um, we started in 2020. It was, our first meeting was over Zoom in 2020 during the, during lockdown. Right. <laughs> and uh, now it's been a joy and a pleasure ever since. So, um, we are here for a live signing. So this is really the best way for the, your readers and fans to get a signed book without, uh, if you're not able to attend one of the events or uh, somehow uh, track Kenny down on the street, I don't encourage that. <laughs> right, right. I don't even do <laughs> but, uh, but this is a great way. And um, your fans have been chomping at the bit. We've got a list of questions. I have a portal right here. Uh -huh. It is a portal into the hearts and minds of all your fans. Uh, How handy. Amazing technology we have. Um, and uh, one thing I want to say for anyone who has not already secured their copy, their signed copy, uh, go to premiercollectibles.com backslash all right, um, which I think is probably my favorite all-time URL. I think uh, premiercollectibles.com backslash all right. You know? Okay. <laughs> So you're still all right. Um, so let's let's launch in. Let's get right. some questions answered. Please, see, see, what, see what you can see what you can do here. Uh, the first question comes from Matthew in Augusta, Georgia, which I thought was appropriate. Augusta being a golf mecca, and oh. you having so it's, uh, it's a uh, Caddyshack. It, it it's it could be. Um, we'll find out. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, he thanks you for signing his book uh, and thanks you for your time. Uh, growing up, what is the first song you remember playing on guitar? First song on guitar? Well, I started in guitar, on guitar in folk music. I was at the tail end of the folk music. I think it was Blowing in the Wind. Yeah, was that's the first a good one. one that I learned. That's Bob a good Dylan. one. I had a guitar teacher, uh, Rod Ruggles, mm -hmm. and Rod was a subscriber to Sing Out magazine. Yeah. which was the Bible for folkies back then. Wow. And then he showed me the song and he sang it for me, Blowing in the Wind. So I had not heard the Bob Dylan version yet. <laughs> That's great. So I learned great. Rod's version out of Sing Out magazine. Yeah. Do you remember when you heard the, the Dylan's version? Do you, was it a... <laughs> no, it, <laughs> Just it was sort of gradually... probably like a day later. Right, you know, right. Because I had to know more about this guy that had written this song. And, sure. and because the song was so powerful, so impacting that... It, even without him singing it, I had to learn that song. And that was really the first force to get me to want to write a song. Yeah. Well, the magic I, inherent in that writer's style. That's, um, it seems appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Becky in Tewksbury, Massachusetts asks, um, oh, this is a heavy question. You ready for a heavy question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We all sacrifice something of ourselves when we push ourselves to greatness um, and potentially lose ourselves to fame. Do you regret any of the sacrifices that you made? I think for me, the, the regrets are sort of, um, uh, well, I won't say love hate, but more like uh, mixed emotions was my, my dedication to my career simultaneous with becoming a father yeah. and so my oldest kids got less of me than my younger it's as as i became older and realized the time was actually yeah. a, a commodity that you can lose and not have enough of yeah. i spent more time 
at home with my children, with my youngest. Yeah. But um, yeah, so yeah, my my biggest regret would be that I didn't have more time to spend with my kids. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, and I'm sure that touring, that recording is just such an it just takes over your life. Yeah, and and because it's also my passion. Right. So right. it's not just like I have a job that I have to show up for, but right. it's a job <laughs> that I want to do. It's what yeah. I love to do. And I'm torn between that and, and being a parent, but you can't be a at home parent if you're, you know, a yeah. musician. That's why in the book I refer to myself as a traveling salesman because <laughs> my dad was a traveling salesman. And yeah. so I knew what it felt like to have my father away from home. Yeah. And therefore when he when he took me from Seattle, we drove together from Seattle to California, how thrilling that was for me to get that much time just to me and my father. Yeah. And um, and then when I hit the road, I didn't I, you know, I knew that I was doing rock and roll, but I realized that I'd kind of inadvertently rerun my father's relationship with my own kids. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's like the Harry Chapin song. The, uh... Yeah. Well, believe me, <laughs> cats in the cradle all the time. Yeah. Uh, OK, so Catherine in Sacramento, California, of course. Uh, what doesn't a fool believe? <laughs> <laughs> or if that's a tougher question maybe uh talk a little bit about the collaboration on that writing that song with yeah yeah what, what, i want to ex expand expand a little bit on on the title itself yeah because i didn't see it coming it was a line that michael had on his mind mm -hmm. which i thought was was brilliant in that the, the title of the song is actually two sentences put together what a fool believes, <laughs> what a fool believes he sees, no wise man has the power to reason away. And what seems to be is always better than nothing. Yes. I thought, what, a, what a great concept. Yes. It was like we made up an old saying. <laughs> <You did. laughs> a truism in, in, in the, in it's, uh, it's, it's great. Well, it is, uh, that is my personal favorite Yacht Rock song. Uh, I think yeah, it's I think probably, it's the number one yacht rock song. Yeah, I think it's probably the best. Thank um, you. So <laughs> this is it. it. Comes in a very very close second, but uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. The, the uh, I think she wanted me to tell the story of writing it. Uh, well, she was she she was asking what doesn't a fool believe? Yeah, so, but, uh, yeah uh, that any number of things reflexive. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, <laughs> but um, but we'll go to Jack in uh, Fernandina Beach. Florida, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, I know the answer to this question, but but I'll ask you. So you probably can, read the book. Yeah, I did read the book. <laughs> I read it several times. <laughs> so, uh, Jack wants to know, do you still perform with a live band? Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah, I'm touring this year. Yep. I've also been doing these book shows, which I haven't had a chance to talk to you about. I'm really going well. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we created a, a, a book show with a fellow named um, Adam Reeder, uh, who Bills himself as a professor of rock. Yeah. And I did a couple of interviews with him and he was so knowledgeable about my material and my music yeah. that I decided bring him along, put him on a chair next to me. We'll do the interviews. You know, he'll ask the questions based on what he's read about the book. Uh, and then if we do an, a song that dovetails into the writing or we do a story that dovetails into the song of writing a song, mm -hmm. we'll, then I'll get up and or he'll leave and I'll get the band out and I'll play it with the band. Yeah. So it's gone really well. Well, I can't wait to see it. I'm going to see yeah. you at town hall on uh, yeah. Thursday, I believe. I told him to always throw in two or three questions that I can't possibly see coming. So we have this <laughs> level well, of spontaneity. OK, well, you've, you've inspired me. I'm going to I'm going to I'm, I'm going to break away from the questions. I'm going to ask one of my own okay. um, or, or at least prompt you to tell us this story. And okay. And I hope it's one you remember to some extent. I hope it is too. <laughs> it is my favorite uh, bit of trivia from the book. Um, and it is this. You toured as a member, or early early in your music career, uh -huh. you toured as a member of the Electric Prunes. Right. Uh, for those of you who Just don't Just a regular know, rock and roll. Band. A rock and roll, sort of psychedelic rock and roll band. They had, I think they had one sort of hit. Some, I had a couple of hits, but yeah. the biggest was probably I had too much to dream last night. I had night. too much to dream last Which night. I'm guessing was 66, maybe. Yeah. yeah. 
but when you toured with them, it wasn't really the, it, it was you. And I mean, were there any of the electric prunes right, the, actually the drummer, in there? <laughs> uh, um, uh, Ken, the guitar player and the uh, bass player, Mark Tilling. Yeah. Got it. Got it. No, I, I, um, I enjoyed that. And, you know, just the so, name of the band, the electric prunes. Electric prunes. That's, <laughs> I just wanted a moment to bust me on that band. Yeah. So that was a band that I, I dropped out of college to go on tour with. My friend Jeremy Stewart was hired to be their new music director. The manager owned the name. So the, right. the founding members of the band, three of them, quit the band. And um, then the manager just decided to replace them right. and hired my friend uh, Jeremy. And Jeremy called me. I was in class when he called me. And he said, what, what do you think about going on the road with the electric prunes? I said, well, do we have to play their songs? He said, no, they, can, they told us we can play anything we want to. <laughs> So we hit the road. But the crowd wasn't always receptive, the, right? The crowd, the crowd did not agree with the manager. And uh, that uh, I, the first show we played, Uncle, I think it was Uncle Alfie's Lighthouse Carnival or something like that, Admiral Alfie, mm -hmm. and in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the middle of the show, the plan was to, to break down to an acoustic set. Right. And I would do... Danny's song and House of Pooh Corner. I'd written them as seniors in high school. Yeah. So as a senior in high school. And so I pulled the guitar out. And now this is a psychedelic rock audience. And I'm playing Danny's song, <laughs> which is, has never failed before. <laughs> but, but that particular that performance, by the time I got into House of Pooh Corner, there were people actually getting up and leaving. Right. And that was <laughs> shocking to me. I'd never had that happen before. Um, and that actually stuck with me. By the time I got to Loggins and Messina, I was still waking up in the middle of the night in a sweat <laughs> and going, oh, my God, I have to open the show alone again. How is this going to go? Well, it reminds me of the uh, of the song uh, Whiskey. Uh, I don't you're going to play anything mellow, mellow at the yeah. Whiskey. Your, your music insurance better be paid up. <laughs> Very much so, especially the Whiskey. You know, because the Troubadour was really the folky club in in los angeles that's where i saw cat stevens i saw james taylor the first time he came in um any number of you know carol king any number yeah. of acts that would become huge from that era yeah. but very few of our kind of act played at the whiskey so when we were offered a gig there i went there early to see well what's the whiskey like these days because i'd seen the doors there right, sure. when i was a senior in high school Historic. As the, the Doors was there, not as headliners, they were the house band. Right. You know, and so they played every night. And I went to see a band called Love, which was oh, sure. Arthur Lee and Love. Yeah. Yeah. And this opening act just blew my mind. I had never seen Jim Morrison before. And I mean, he was Jim Morrison even then. Yeah. And it was a, a life changing, literally, for me was as a songwriter. Was that when he was turned the other way, or was that after he had finally no, discovered? No that he should face the audience. <laughs> well, he, he faced the audience, but he was really making love to the microphone. Right. It was all like an <laughs> octopus just wrapped around the microphone. But the, the depth of the, his commitment to what he was doing was stunning to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that was a fun departure. But we'll go back to the uh, fan, the questions from your fans and readers. Uh, we have, uh, oh, here we go. We're going to continue with the golf theme. This is Roger in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, you have had a wonderful career. He starts out. Uh -huh. You know what's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> if you could have, if you could have one do-over or mulligan, uh, right. what, what would that be? Wow, you know, I haven't looked at it that way. You know, what could I do over? I'm sure there are a number of them. Um, yeah, I remember um, one from the book. If you okay, want, okay, yeah, to please. <laughs> Here's where the soundtrack for a certain movie, uh, Flashdance. Oh yeah, no that that would be my mulligan for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. That um, and the story is, if I may, sure. That um, I had done Caddyshack, uh, and I was called into Jerry Bruckheimer's office to check out the new movie that he was making, and we watched it on a moviola a screen about only that big, um, and that was Flashdance, and I liked what I was seeing, and I thought this is going to be a big hit, and I'd like to be a part of it, so. I decided to to write a song for the movie, but at the same time, the timeline that they needed the song in totally conflicted with my tour. Right. So I, I had to just face facts and drop out of the project in order to do my tour. And the first um, 
hall we went to to play was in Salt Lake City. Right. And it was about a 15 foot high stage. And in walking. I can't, I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> you but... shouldn't be laughing. <laughs> I should not it's laugh a sad at all. story. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so anyway, I walked onto stage in the dark, which is a stupid thing to do when you're on a 50, 15 foot stage. And I took one step too many and went over the backside and fell down, rolled high enough to actually spin in midair and land on my back on a packing case and broke three ribs. And then I laid on the floor there while 10,000 people were calling my name. So none of the crew could find me. So I'm laying in the dark on the floor <laughs> with a Shakespearean Help. moment of people going, Kenny, Kenny. You know, like, anyway, they finally found me and they dragged me into the dressing room, which shouldn't have been done. And um, I was sent to the hospital. A few days later, Don, Donnie Osmond loaned us his jet so that I could get home. And apparently the, the, the doctors in Salt Lake City were a little too good <laughs> because they, they patched me up in a way, I think it was the Percodan yeah, that yeah. helped me uh, or faked me out. And I thought, hey, I'm just laying here doing nothing. Sure. Why don't I go in the studio and, and do that song for Flashdance? So we booked some studio time and I went in the studio, but again, the Percodan was working its magic. I cut the song in the wrong key oh, wow. and I couldn't hit the high notes of my own song. <laughs> and then rather than get creative or make it a duet with a female or recut the track, I realized that I was just too out of it to actually keep going. That I was, I was in more pain than I realized. So I went home and that was the end of that. It's amazing to, uh, and, uh, so everyone knows we're on live. Uh, we lost our, our uh, picture of the, the book, but it's uh, now we've got a screensaver. Looks nice though, right? Yeah, I have those of you who want to put bids on any of those apartments. <laughs> That's right. It's either Greece or Italy. I'm not sure. Looks good. Looks yeah. Good. Um, but it's just amazing. I mean, because, you know, I, so I grew up in the, the heart of, your soundtrack era and and I loved them all. And to imagine that you could have also been on Flashdance. So Another <laughs> boggles movie the mind. The era, yeah. <laughs> but uh so but not everything works out. So um uh two uh, uh of your fans have asked a similar question with Jeremy in St. Louis and Ruth in Dacula, Georgia. Really? I actually lived one in Georgia letter for away a from of, Dracula. Exactly. I, I I assume that's not a typo. Um, Dracula, Georgia would be nice too. I'd be Dacula. <laughs> Dacula. You never know in Georgia. Um, uh, I lived there for a couple of years, so I know. Uh, anyway, the, um, uh, what are your favorite things to do when you're not working? How do you relax during your downtime? Those might be two different questions, but they're well, similar. No, that's, it's similar. <laughs> yeah. No, when I'm home and I'm not working, which start 2020 really made the difference on that. Yeah. We had a lot of time home. And uh, my lady and I have e-bikes and we like to head out into the world early sometimes. Yeah. But uh, our primary hobby is pickleball. Oh, wow. A lot of people oh, don't know I've about it. I've heard a lot yet. about it lately. Like yeah, it's, it's, it's the fastest growing sport in the United States. Wow. And it's the only problem is it's harder and harder to get a court empty. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, but yeah, you it's can't, really Kenny fun. Loggins, you can't sort of. Push some people aside. No, no, I no. Do that. no. <laughs> hire, hire Not them. your style. Like when Not we were kids style. and there'd be enough of us to take over a basketball court, right. you know? Right. right. But no, uh, but there's, you can, you can do what they call playing in, which is everybody gets one game and then they rotate out and another team plays in, but it's really fun. It's a lot of lateral movement, a lot of cardio. And is it so uh, describe it because I don't even know. Well, I've you know, tennis, play. right? Yeah, of course. Sure, well, sure. if tennis and ping pong had a baby, <laughs> it would be pickleball. <laughs> Got it. It's played with a wiffle ball. It's two against two, like about a half size tennis court. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a regular tennis racket or no, it's, uh, it's like a, that? it's a paddle, paddle. Okay. but it's it. uh, like ours has a tungsten uh, inside the paddle. So it's lightweight and you can be quick with it. Huh. And you know, it's just a really fast game because you're playing with a wiffle ball. You know, so yeah, yeah. you can be eight feet apart and hitting the ball as hard as you possibly can. Right, right. And and you have to be really quick. Your reaction time has to be fast. Wow. Well, I'm going to have to play. The play ping pong part is is the English you can put on the ball. Right. The spin right. you can put. With a wiffle ball, you can do all kinds. You can of do things. all kinds of things. So the surface of the paddle has to be regulation. Got it. Got it. Okay. 
I don't think that's the answer they were expecting. Um, so there you go. Good. <laughs> that's good. Uh, Marley in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, what was your favorite songwriting experience and why? Uh, well, the first thing that pops into my mind is, is what a fool believes with Mike right. McDonald. You know, when I met him for the first time was when we had our first writing date. Mm -hmm. And while I was taking the, getting the guitar out of the trunk of my car, the, the, its front door was ajar. And I heard strains of bam, 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 da, bam, 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 bam. And he's this is emotion, <laughs> singing what would eventually be the actual words. Right, right. And... <laughs> And all he had was the verse that do, 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 stop. And my imagination kept going. I wasn't yet in the house. And I heard the, the bridge. Do, 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 do. It was what came to me. So I knock on the door and I say, Mike, what was that thing you were just playing? Yeah. Uh, I have an idea for the next section. So we went immediately to the piano and started working on Waterfall Bleeds. Oh, so my story is, and I use the punchline in the book, um, I like to say that we were writing together before we met. <laughs> you were outside. You're yeah. that's great. Uh, I know that you've seen the uh, the ser the web series that that popularized the term yacht rock. Yacht rock. Um, and of course, they they fictionalize or they present a, a version of that story that is um, not similar in that I think you're actually on a dock, <laughs> <You're right. laughs> <Of course. laughs> something like yeah. that. But uh, I remember reading a quote from Michael McDonald saying something to the effect of, um, uh, you know, it was obviously a joke, but there were there were certain truths in in the in the series and the, oh, yeah. <laughs> the different storylines. You remember his quote? You know that was it, it was it was that way. I'm I'm paraphrasing it. There it was he was he was basically saying he was sort of begrudgingly saying there's a little bit of truth. In some of the stuff. Well, now I have to go watch it. I yeah, exactly. What part he thought <laughs> was true about it. Exactly. Um, okay, so uh, we have, uh, oh, interesting. Mike in Italy asks, oh. if you could change, this is, this is our first international question. I think it is. If you could change one thing about the music business, what would it be? Only one thing? <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, the, yeah, you the, the business one. of today is yeah. until recently, until Top Gun yeah. Maverick came out, mm -hmm. I wasn't all that involved in the business of today because right. it's changed dramatically from what I did back in, sure. in the days when Clive Davis signed me to Columbia Records. Yeah, But um, I actually am changing a part of it by my lady and I are creating NFTs yeah. so that I can stay connected with my audience mm -hmm. and then uh if they join up we have a a, a, a qr code that we use right. in concert and people just hit join there's no cost to it or anything it's yeah. just to be able to collect a way to stay in touch with my fans because i'm going to cut way back on touring next year yeah. yeah and um and so i can send songs out directly as i write them i can send them out mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of using a record or or maybe special events of you know performance from my home or something but to make a direct connection to the fans is the change that i'm referring to so there's less intermediaries there's less people to grab a hold of whatever's coming yeah. in and try to charge for something that needn't be charged for we just yeah. make a connection ticket master list of uh yeah. <laughs> surcharges yeah absolutely um, right. Uh, no, it's amazing. It's amazing what you can do now in terms of social media and NFTs and all kinds of technology that really allows for yeah. a more direct, um, yeah, direct relationship with yeah. fan base. Yeah. Speaking of which, if you have not purchased your signed book, go to premiercollectibles.com backslash all right. And uh, Kenny, uh, he's he's not signing now because I'm keeping him talking. But uh, he'll have to sign a bunch later. Yeah, a bunch. <laughs> and by bunch, he means a bunch. A bunch, yes. Yeah. Kenny was a little shocked when he found out how many books he was going to sign. But uh, that's a good. But thing, he'll right? be all right. It's a great thing. It's a I'll great. Be thing. still all right. <laughs> still all right. Um, okay, Carrie in Long Beach. Uh, what is your favorite song to sing during a concert? Um, it depends on the kind of audience. Yeah. You know. Um, 
I do the Redwoods version of What a Fool Believes, which I love to do that. It's a whole nother version of, of the song. Mm -hmm. And that goes over really well. That actually was a hit for me in Paris. And I didn't know it when I went on my European tour. Oh, wow. I got to Paris. I was in the sound check and the, the promoter comes up to me and says, you're going to play your hit, right? I didn't have a hit here. He said, well, it's What a Fool Believes. I said, no, you're thinking a doobie release. He said, no, not here. You had the hit here. Oh, wow. And it was my version of the duet version with Mike McDonald from the wow. Redwoods. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. I do that. But that just, uh, you that know, I, on I there. think yeah. Footloose and Danger Zone, think, right. I think of them as one song. Right. Because <laughs> the audience response is so strong. They get up and dance. Footloose, you have to get up and dance or someone shoots you. Right. Right. I mean, it's Absolutely. obligatory now. Absolutely. And I was going to say, I remember sitting in front of the cable television, dancing with the gopher to Still All Right. Uh, or, sorry, to. I'm, I'm all right. right. <laughs> um, I'm still trying to promote this book, you know. Right, like, <laughs> always. Um, and then, of course, the the video for Footloose was one of my favorite things ever as a kid. I, I would yeah. uh, the idea it would combined dance with adventure. It was like Indiana Jones, and because he would swing across in the, oh, right, in the whole swing warehouse, and, and well, someone who looked a little like him was swinging. Right. Around <laughs> it was not Kevin Bacon. You know the insurance company was thinking <laughs> like Kevin Bacon, swing on a rope. Right. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon would have definitely been uh, less poignant, or <laughs> less yeah. ubiquitous. Um, so uh, let's see here. We're going to, uh, oh, you're being asked, I don't, I don't know if you're going to be doing this, but but I'll ask uh, and maybe we can talk about previous times. Uh, uh, Yusuke in Japan and Iris in Germany are asking if you're ever planning to do any more international tours. Yep. Countries. It's funny uh, that, th that this could should come up now, but there's actually been some talk of possibly no commitment here, <laughs> possibly doing a Japanese tour. Great. And I've never been to Australia, but it seems like the next logical thing. If I'm going all the way to oh, Japan, well, yeah. I should probably jump over to Australia. Sure. So maybe some of my Australian fans can write a note to local promoters and say, bring Kenny over. <laughs> Since I'm there, let's make like it happen. It. I've never like been to Australia. Um, so now a question from Canada. We were just we're just all over the globe right now. It's just um, from the entire from country of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Curtis, Curtis, as he represents the entire country of Canada from Not Edmonton, Curtis. Alberta. Um, uh, have you? Oh, he wants to know if you've ever been asked to be on the television show Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> and there's a corollary here. That's an easy answer. Yes, I have. No, I said no. You said no. no. Well, it's it's I. I understand. Uh, right. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, the question is, and I actually don't know necessarily the answer to this, or, or at least I don't remember. Have you ever been asked or have you ever, ever appeared in any of the movies or television that you've done soundtracks for? Or have you ever had like a cameo? No, or, I never have. I really wanted a cameo in the new Maverick. Sure. I sure. thought, okay, well, just have me be, I'll just walk through as one of the instructors, <laughs> you know? Uh, the they missed parents. an opportunity there. They missed yeah, an opportunity. Yeah, I really, I actually asked Tom, I said, if there's, <laughs> is there any possibility? And right. said, you know, no. Yeah. He doesn't like saying no either. He's, right. He's, <laughs> I can imagine that. <laughs> he's, he's a good guy. He's very agreeable. Wants to help. Right. Sorry, sure. can't help you with that. Got it. Got it. Well, we all have to say no sometimes. So, um, James in Pittston, Pennsylvania. Um, let's see here. If you, oh, here's an interesting one. If you were not a singer songwriter and you were back in high school or college again, what else do you, would you have, what else did you aspire to do? What else would you think of to do now if you were that age again? Well, um, I was, my favorite class, my best class was English. Oh yeah. And so I, yeah. I studied in that happily i loved poetry i loved reading yeah. but um that aside because i still probably wouldn't have been good enough to have your job <laughs> i wouldn't have made that oh don't count on it <laughs> yeah, right. but i loved working with wood so i might have given carpentry a try wow. finished carpentry in particular well let's let's talk about it because because i could tell when you as you worked on this and as we talked and you asked me questions and told me a little bit about how your approach and everything um, that you read a lot, that you you enjoy, and that you 
you know, you went and, and you read some other um, uh, memoirs that musicians right. had, had published. And uh, talk a little bit about that and, you know, how did it influence what you wanted to do and how you wanted to do it? Well, as I read the different memoirs, I got a sense of what aspects to the memoir were most interesting to me. Now, of course, my, my interest is skewed by the fact that I am a musician. Right. But I loved especially the early days of their stories. But I preferred reading memoirs that were well written. Yeah. And as opposed to the ones where it's just dictation. Sure. It's like series of interviews. Right. And so <laughs> right. it's it's a it's kind of it leaves me flat because we don't write the way we talk. Right. And the talking ones didn't have enough structure to it. Yeah. Um, and then some of them felt forced and some of them felt like the book of lies. Right. You know, I won't <laughs> right. say who, but there's one particular <laughs> famous person that I knew was a book of lies. Yeah, yeah. But you have to accept the fact that you have an unreliable narrator. Sure. You know, sure. That, that there's maybe something to hide, like heroin addiction or right. something. You know, like right. they may not want to tell you the whole story. Um, but I felt that I needed to tell the truth as much as I possibly could yeah. without without. Um, affecting my visitation rights on my children right. sure. <laughs> or whatever. And, Not um, upsetting anyone too much. Yeah. Or, you know, and we talked with the Hachette lawyers about sure. certain aspects that I'd put in the book. Sure, sure. That sure. we wanted to make sure we would be, I would be safe with that. <laughs> yes. um, but um, there were, yeah, so I was definitely influenced by the memoirs that I read. What aspects of them were more interesting to me? I was re really reluctant to go too deeply into the marriages, you know, because sure. sometimes you can lose your reader on that. Mm -hmm. um, I went much more lightly with uh, talking about my first marriage, but I had to go into my second. Uh, they, they just signed up. <laughs> I have to go into my second marriage a little more deeply because she and I had written a book together right. about our early days together. Sure. And so there were there was still strong interest in well, what happened to that relationship, how that happened how did I recover or whatever? Well, it also, uh, one of the things you said to me early on is that um, you were willing to, to you know, talk about your personal life and, and, um, and be as honest as you could. You wanted it ultimately all to relate back to the music. Um, right. right. And sort of what inspired some of the songs and the albums. And uh, yeah, so I know that some, when, a lot of the music, it's a lot of my music is, is autobiographical. You know, I have a friend who I wrote with in Blue Sky Writers, Gary Burr, whose business card said, I make shit up. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that was a CYA action on his part. Right, right. You know, right. Uh, but I know my stuff is autobiographical. Therefore, my relationship, my marriages, my, my children, those all come to play. I mean, yeah. a song like Real Thing from, from the um, Leap of Faith album. Yeah has got to come from my marriage and the dissolution of my first marriage. The whole Leap of Faith album yeah. is very influenced by the dissolution of my first marriage and then the, the falling in love time and the creation of the second marriage. And I know that's that's one of your personal, that's maybe your personal favorite album of right. yours. And, and I think that, I think you uh, you talk about in the book, there's a, uh, a large segment of your core fan base who are leapers. Is Leap, that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Call themselves leapers. Love it. I love it. They were there. <laughs> this, the book really became the soundtrack for a lot of people's lives. Yeah. 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 I mean, what I the, mean, the, I the, said the it al wrong. The, <laughs> yeah. the album. The played, album. Was the soundtrack. And, and the people who discovered that album are hardcore fans. Yeah. They, they get it. They get what yeah. it is I do and what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Well, that's great. So, um, Let's see. Where did we? Where did that leave us? Oh, um, so a couple of questions about some of your um, collaborations. Not Michael McDonald this time. We've talked a lot about okay. that one. Uh, but Rebecca in Severn, Maryland. Uh, what song or songs did you write with Richard Marks? She says that she loves all your music and it puts her back in a time in her life uh, when it when she needed it. So, uh -huh. but the question is about Richard Marks. Um, and I know you did a little bit of collaborating with him. Is right. That, yeah. Richard's book was one of the books that I referred to right. when I was you know, getting a sense of what kind of book I wanted to write. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mary Carr's book, uh, um, oh, yeah, Liars, Liars Club, Club mm -hmm. and also her Art of Memoir yeah. was influential to me for finding my voice. Yeah. A big issue for her. Where, where is the writer's voice? So I wanted to make sure when I was working with Jason, 
and I called you yeah. and I said, you know, I really need to make sure my voice is in this book. So yeah. we, I rewrote everything, I rewrote every <laughs> chapter. To you, his you, uh, you, you got your pencil out and yeah. uh, yeah. no, it's great. Um, and we should mention, uh, Kenny did work with a collaborator named Jason Turbo, a fantastic collaborator. And it was really, yeah, he's a great guy. And we, we leaned up against each other in a, the way a creative tension can be. Yeah. You know, because he had his way of doing things and then I wanted to say yes, but I need. Right. So I would take everything he submitted as a timeline yeah. and then work within his timeline and go, and this is what the story really is. Right. And then we just mess with the grammar. And that only makes sense for someone whose uh, career has been full of collaboration um, right. with, with everyone from Stevie Nicks to, um, you're forgetting uh, one person which, that which which is uh, which by uh messina jim no messina. No, no that's no. not who i'm referring to no? tell me let me you think. did mention jimmy yeah uh, michael jackson michael jackson i was gonna uh, i was gonna talk about that and we are the world um in that yeah. sort of era yeah tell, tell us a little bit about that i met him when he first was coming out with off the wall yeah. uh and uh, i was invited to a listening party and so we sat together at the party and we talked about it. And I said, well, would you ever be open to singing on an, on an album, you know, on yeah. my album? Yeah. And he said, sure, yeah. Yeah, I'll be there. So he came and and I, I, I say in my book, I wish that I'd had the wherewithal to write a song with him so that yeah. we could have actually worked with a groove and had something a little more yeah. Michael Jackson-y, but it still came out pretty cool. Yeah. song I wrote with uh, 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 the lead singer of Mr. Mister. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, Richard Page. Okay. And um, it's called Who's Right, Who's Wrong. Michael came in to sing on, but he was singing kind of like a background singer. Uh -huh. And I said, can you put more of your personality into this? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, you mean you want it stinky? <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. Make it stinky. <laughs> make, it stinky. <laughs> and, uh, make it stinky. And so he put a lot of his flourishes in it from that point on. Yeah. Oh, that's great stuff. Well, you know, Yacht Rock is its own sort of term and, and – Everyone has a different kind of definition of what that means and everything, but but really that group of musicians in the late seventies and into the eighties, uh, a lot of the guys in Toto and, and right. you Mr. Mister and the, and uh, you know just tons of these guys who were to some degree studio musicians, but just you know came up with some of the most amazing pop we've ever heard and so and you worked with all those guys <laughs> yeah it was really and, and and also uh the new york guys you know i worked with uh celebrate me home i did most of it in new york yeah so i had uh, uh steve gadd and and eric gale bob james on keyboards bob james yeah and the taxi theme yeah absolutely and and westchester lady i think that was. yeah and and um who else? So Richard T on on keyboards, but primarily church organ. Yeah. And um, Steve Jordan on drums. Uh, anyway, yeah, the list goes on. So yeah. I really, we were dipping into that pool of of jazz jazzers that were inventing smooth jazz, right. which is right. more arranged instead of a highly spontaneous jazz. It's a more right. arranged form, right? But in that style of music, and that that sort of there their influence from R and B and then their jazz chordal right. influence then came into my writing. So as soon as I met Bob James, within days we wrote Celebrate Me Home. Yeah. Which is very it became, complicated uh, compared to your Lager inadvertent James. holiday song. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I didn't know that it was just the opening line was Home for the Holidays, yeah. which came because I was in New York during the holidays right. and I wanted to go home. Right. And I was still recording with Phil. Those, some of my favorite holiday songs are the ones where it's almost a coincidence that it's about yeah. the holidays. Yeah. <laughs> so like Joni's uh, thing. Joni, yeah. Joni Mitchell's a yeah. great example. Chopping down trees. Um, Billy Joel has one uh, that's not one of his hits, but it's, it starts with Turn on all the Christmas lights. My baby's coming home tonight. And oh. So, um, but the, the rest of the song isn't as Christmassy as that. Right. It's usually <laughs> the case. Yeah. So interesting stuff um okay let's see here um we have uh okay this is a now this is a collaboration i did not know about and you'll tell me <laughs> Brittany in oak park illinois uh 
He says, hi, Mr. Loggins. My mom and I are big fans of yours and wanted to ask, how did you and Shanice end up duetting on the live version of Love Will Follow? Now, this that's is not a good a, question. That's not a song I'm familiar with. No, I Tell worked, me all about it. I worked with Babyface. Um, oh, okay. And in the process, I got turned on to Shanice and then I heard her music. Yeah. And I then when I came time to cast my singers for that Redwoods show, uh, that's part I of the thought Redwoods. of Shanice, so I called her. Yeah. A cold call, as they say. Got it. And Got it. Just said, "Would you like to, you know, perform with me?" And yeah. she was just such a sweet young lady. Yeah. Um, I don't know if she still is or not because I haven't seen her since then. But <laughs> well, Brittany and her mom want you to collaborate with her again if you have a chance. So that's that's what they're. Um, is, I don't know if she's still active in the yeah. business or not. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and uh, Shanice, if you're watching, <laughs> <laughs> give me a call. <laughs> um, Andrew in Chicago. Illinois, of course. Um, uh, let's see here. We, we've talked a little bit about this, but what do you think about the music business of today compared to what it was like when you started? We did we did address I mean, this did in a lot of that. ways. Yeah, well, the, the music yeah. business now is all about streaming. Yeah, you know, yeah. and um, if you can if you stream enough, you can get a, a full turkey dinner at Denny's <laughs> with what they pay you. <laughs> you could probably buy two of them after the Top Gun uh, well, yeah, resurgence. Top, you, could, you know, now you, Danger for, Zone, I just heard uh, two days ago, Danger Zone is streaming a million a day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, well, well to, within you know, three uh, years, I'll definitely have. You, what you need is a, a, to have a song used in Stranger Things. Did you see that Kate Bush uh, oh, running right. up that hill yeah. hit, hit the top 10 because it was in Stranger Things? Right? That's amazing. Yeah. And yeah. she deserves it. Yeah. Oh, she does. Uh, I, that's an exciting one. Um, I love when stuff like that happens, and it's great. You know, I mean, that, the thing if from a fan's point of view, <clears throat> the difference between the music now and, and then, and I, and I wasn't around in your early days, but I was around right. by the late 70s and 80s. <laughs> I was buying, I bought, but loose was the first cassette that I went and bought with my own sort of allowance money at uh -huh. the, the Brookwood Mall uh, Music Land in Birmingham, Alabama. Let's shout I remember out it. the Brookwood I remember Mall. It. <laughs> I think the mall is still there. Music Land is definitely not still there, but yeah. the, <laughs> the mall is, is still there. Um, but uh, but you know the the great. The, the streaming, uh, while it will only buy you a turkey dinner, uh, you know, for the fans to be able to just have access to anything. There's there's a downside to that, too. Uh, you kind of get lost in it. And it's sort of yeah. you don't know what to pick out from the billions of choices. But yeah. it is amazing what you can access now and how quickly. I mean, I just think, you know, when I was a kid, you wanted something, you were going to have to pay $10, $12 for that cassette or $17 for that right. CD and save up or, and or listen to the radio and we would re record the, we would hit record. And you're and one of those, huh? <laughs> That's what Clive Only calls stealing music. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Big, um, uh, but I was, I was a nice guy during the Napster period. I, I did not download much Napster music and uh, I was, I, I, I'm I, not, I, it's just not a deposition. <laughs> You don't have to go into that. <laughs> you know, we were thinking about uh, <clears throat> reading through the book and realizing, you know, I wish we could have added links to the book yeah. so that if somebody's reading a story about what a fool believes, they can hit a link and we'll take them right. to the YouTube video of Mike McDonald and I singing what a fool believes. So we've decided to create our own outside yeah. hit list and we'll just go through the book and pick out all the different songs that I'm writing about yeah. and, give the readers so you can kind of keep your computer next to your book or something. And as you go along or your, your phone for that it. matter, and just click yeah, on a link. Absolutely. So, I saw a Spotify playlist one time that was every song mentioned in girl Marcus's mystery train. And it was some, it went on for like a thousand songs. No <laughs> kidding. And uh, in or it was exactly what you're talking about in order, in order of, of when they were mentioned. And um, yeah. yeah, it's great. Um, but so the, you know, the ability to do things like that now is, is just, it's terrific. And then share them immediately it with makes everybody. It, right, it makes it deeper. I remember, um, well, I don't remember <laughs> <laughs> at this moment, <laughs> no, David Byrne's book. Oh yeah. David sure. Byrne had a lot works. of his influences and sources and, and you could click on those. Links. Oh, right. Right. They, yeah. they, they're only on the ebook. On the ebook. Yeah. 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 That's tough. We, and I'm uh, a little inside publishing here. 
the problem with including the links in an ebook is is they will go dormant. You know, they a link uh, expires. You'll have dead links essentially, oh. and so that's that's part of the reason we. And then they get all smelly and everything. Right, right? exactly. Oh, and then they like the roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to uh, Brett in Sparks, Nevada. Um, ah, yes, beautiful Sparks. Nevada. Exactly. He wants to know, uh, so with Caddyshack, Top, Caddyshack and Top Gun are the two he mentions, but we know there are others. Uh, do you have signed movie posters or anything of that kind hanging in your home for those movies? Yeah, you want to buy one? <laughs> <laughs> Make for an sale, NFT out of it. Go them. to e eBay? And <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I don't yeah. have signed movie posters. It's yeah. a good idea. Some of the art is pretty good. That yeah. Be fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, William in Binghamton, uh, he said, let's see, what does he ask? Uh, uh, this is an interesting, it, it, the way he phrases it, how do you continue to contribute to the music world for so many years? I'm going to, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. Yeah. So how would you account for your longevity? You've been doing this for five decades. Uh, plus. It's in, <laughs> incredibly lucky. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously I've, worked hard at being a professional at what I do and not just because I had paid, but because right. I've, I've studied it as an artist. Yeah. Um, but I think just being in the right place at the right time is why, why I'm still active. I mean, you know, who could predict Maverick being made and right. then, and then them using danger zone again, right. right. And not going to the new young, hot singer songwriter right. to write a new song. You know? That's right. And they, you talked about, I, I've, I've heard you uh, mention in other interviews, talked about you actually recorded a new version i did um, but it amped it up mostly yeah. because i wanted to use the sound systems that exist in the new theaters right, right, right. you know so i wanted a 5.1 or more yeah, sure. version of danger zone so that when the drums come in they come in from behind or something and yeah. you know and i tried to replicate the original version but you know 30 some years later it's very difficult to sound like a 20 year old got it you know? yeah <laughs> <laughs> I can't even sound like a 20 year old anymore. I can't. Yeah. It's, uh, it's tough. <laughs> <No>. really? uh, <laughs> my son's 16, so he's, he's going to have to uh, sub for me. Use your son like Val right. Kilmer did. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. So, uh, so I'm going to ask this question while I look into the stream for more questions. Okay. Um, and we'll see if you can. Come you want on, me to just do like a really long winded yeah, answer? Yeah, you're going to do a really long winded answer to this, which might or might not work given question uh what is the weird funniest question you've ever been asked in an interview that's not fair to me. <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna go to the uh if you had three uh, wishes <laughs> would you wish for another wish <laughs> yeah, uh, the, uh, the weirdest the weirdest question uh don't worry no, well, I'm, we're trying, gonna... I'm trying i'm i think it's worth racking my brain to think about not a not a one, but it's not a weird question. It's just funny. Um, well, that's okay. It, that's what you say. It's the well, weirdest it, or funniest. It, it involves the use of illicit substances. Oh, I see. So I, see. I won't go into that. Well, here I, I've I, I've got a good one. This was this is going to become the weirdest. No, it's I don't know if it's the weirdest question you've ever been asked, but it's interesting. It relates back to the book, and let's remind everyone why we're here. Where it's uh, uh, we're doing a uh, a live conversation with Kenny. Uh, he's Lodders. signing. Kenny Loggins, <laughs> for anyone who's forgotten. Um, no, it's uh, uh, for the book, Still All Right, his memoir. And you can buy your copy at premiercollectibles.com backslash all right. All right. Exactly. All right, all right, all right. To, uh, McConaughey. Yes, quote another another best-selling author. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, here here's the question. It, it has to do with the cover. Um, he is asking, this is uh, Robin, or he or she, I don't know, uh, Robin uh, in LJ, Georgia, is asking about the uh, ripped jeans. Um, so there's she, an important question. There you go. In the, uh, Are the holes in the jeans you're wearing on the cover of the book from actual wearing, or are they store-bought fashionable holes? In the past, I'd had... <laughs> We're going to get a little life story here. In the past, um, I'd had similar from my guitar. Okay. Uh -huh. So, so, so 
So maybe this. Uh, it could have these been days, a great you answer. never know. Yeah, yeah that could be right from the guitar. It could have been a great answer, but no. Just, no those these are definitely store bought. Yeah. If it wasn't that long ago, I would have thrown those away. Right. Thinking that I needed a new, new pair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, this is this fashion statement goes back how many years now? It's been maybe ten years that we've been yeah. wearing the ripped up jean thing. Yeah, and and I do agree with what the what the uh, <laughs> this is a ridiculous answer for <laughs> a ridiculous question, but I I do agree with the idea that I like the look of used jeans better than the look of new jeans. Yeah, and so um, that's all part of how we express ourselves. Exactly, right? exactly, exactly. You've got the hat. I love the hat. Yeah, and I want to give. Uh, kudos to Leslie Hassler, the photographer on this right, cover. Right, right, absolutely. And we did a great series of shots, yeah, and yeah. we've been using a lot of them. Yeah, oh, that's great. That's great. Um, let's see here. Bruce in Milwaukee, which song in your catalog are you most proud of? Difficult question. I get I get that question from the press a lot. Which, what's my favorite personal, you know, this or that? And it depends on the mood I'm in. Um but I'm, I still feel very proud of Conviction of the Heart. Yeah. It was really set the tone and the mood for uh, Leap of Faith when Guy Thomas and I wrote that. Yeah. And, uh, and then I think Real Thing is a song yeah. about divorce that mm -hmm. is extremely honest. Mm -hmm. And um, I, to my knowledge, I know of no other song that's a pro-divorce song yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. written in pop culture. Right. Yeah, and... Uh, and I have a song I wrote for my son, Cody, that Richard Marks and I wrote together because right. there was a question about my work with Richard earlier yeah. uh, called uh, The One That Got Away. Right. Uh, that's I was remembering that from the that's the one remind me in the book where you sort of, the line sort of comes to you. You don't really realize what it's about. And you figure it out. Well, that's uh, the chorus of Conviction uh, of the Heart. That's Conviction of the Heart. Yeah. Right. Got, it. Got it. One with yeah. the earth, one with the sky, one with everything in life. And that came out of the blue. I dreamt that. Yeah. The night we wrote, we wrote a guy and I wrote "Conviction of the Heart" that day, yeah. and then the the connection from the character in the song, and that line. I knew the line. I knew that one with the earth needed to be a part of that song. Mm. It was like a refrain, a chorus, a sing along. Yeah. But I wasn't sure lyrically how it fit with the character until years later, yeah. when I realized that that is the metamorphosis of that character to become aware of his connection to life itself, to the, to life on the planet, to yeah. what, where his place is with all that. That's why up until that point, he feels disconnected from everything. There's a, a pivotal line in the song, I'd never given love with any conviction of the heart. Yeah. And he, he's asking, why am I? Why do I feel dis so disassociated from my life? Mm -hmm. And then when the chorus comes in, that's the answer. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think what some fans of yours might not realize and many of them do, of course, but but that you really started in this almost purely as a songwriter. Like that's you were right. writing songs for other people. Right. So talk a little bit about that and how that kind the, of started. The problem with that was, yeah, I got signed a hundred dollars a week to a publishing company in LA um, called ABC Wingate. It was an ABC affiliate, and um, that. I just was thinking, well, I'll, I'll write songs for other people until the day comes, if it ever does, that I get to record my own. And so I would go in and I would make demos in their actual recording studio where they were making hit records. Right. Uh, at night, I would go in like at 10 o'clock at night with my own players and we'd record one or two of the songs that I was giving to Wingate to publish. Yeah. And they paid for the studio time. Yeah. So I was kind of cutting my teeth making my own demos yeah. for my songs. But my publisher said to me months later, he said, the problem is your songs, they have high notes that a lot of our ex can't hit. Right. You know, that, right. that the range of your, your vocal range is beyond the ability of, of our hit ex. Yeah, yeah. And so it really, he said, I recommend you end up recording these yourself. And, it, and I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one, and then, so one of the first places your work, really appeared in a wider to a wider audience was on the nitty gritty dirt band album right um uh, uh uncle um, uncle charlie uncle and his, dog, and his teddy. dog teddy yes yeah. yes it was a great album and how many of those songs are yours is it four i think four yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yukon railroad 
yeah. Prodigal's Return, which I never recorded with Jimmy. Yeah. Did you, so it, it, was that a case of sort of the company kind of provided those songs to the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band? You never met them or? Oh no, I met them. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, the company actually didn't get those covers. Yeah, I was oh, I was at a party one night, and there were a bunch of players there, and we kind of all sat in a circle and took turns playing our own songs. Yeah. And uh, at the at this one particular party, there were a couple of guys there from the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, mm -hmm. and they loved what I say what I call the song about the bear, Winnie right. the Pooh. Sure. House of Pooh Corner. Sure. And they wanted to record House of Pooh Corner, and that was going to be my first professional recording of one of my own songs. Uh, not me on vocals, but them. Yeah. And then uh, I got a call from their man, their manager, uh, John McEwen, who said, we can't record the song because the, the we've been inundated by with phone calls from the Disney lawyers right. saying that right. they have a copyright on that <laughs> fuzzy little sucker <clears throat> right. and we sure. cannot record. And, sure. and then I just happened to, to know, be dating the daughter of the CEO of the Disney Corporation. <laughs> That's very so, helpful. When, very when helpful. people say, uh, ask me questions about my longevity, <laughs> it's because I'm in the right place at the right, right time. Right. You're dating you know, the right you, person. That you, was... can't, you can't <laughs> write that. You can't make that up. And uh, and so she and my friend Doug Inglesby helped me yeah. uh, make that connection to her father. And then he said, I'm sure no one's ever going to hear this. I'll call the lawyers <laughs> and tell them that it's okay. However many covers and children's albums later, yeah. and everything. Yeah. You know, um, I'm sure he was retroactively fired. <laughs> <laughs> he was. <laughs> but then all CEOs are retroactive. That is true. That is the, Sooner or later. They have a shelf life, right? Um, so uh, I don't know. We, we have about three more minutes, it looks like. So oh. we'll, we'll squeeze in a few, a few more uh, pieces of conversation. Are you here. getting any more questions? Um, we, I, let's see here. What is, Don't admit it if you're not. Right, right. There is, it's a, it's, it's a little overwhelming. The, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm starting to lose track of which ones I've asked and which ones I haven't. Let's see here. Um, yeah, they're, they're here, but. This is scintillating, right? I'm going to get, yes, exactly. This is great. This is great internet TV. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask you some, I'm going to be okay. selfish. Okay. Good. <laughs> I, I want you to, because you, you know the book inside out. So. That's right. I'm going to ask a question on behalf of uh, our, our pre, the people on our team who, uh, who do, did love the children's albums and still do, I'm sure, but might not listen to them as much as they did when they were younger. Um, uh, what was the inspiration? I mean, obviously, House of Pooh Corner was was a kind of an entree into that. From, uh, but right. but how did that how did that come about? The inspiration was twofold. Yeah. The first was that my wife Julia was pregnant with what would be our first son, mm -hmm. my third son, and um, and in the process of uh, of watching the pregnancy show up, if you will, I realized that I was about to be launched into another couple of years of Barney. And I thought, <laughs> you know, Barney's fine for what Barney does. Yeah. But I thought, why wouldn't somebody make a children's album that the parents could love to? Right, sure. Because what, well, like it or not, you're going to listen to it about 6,000 times. Yeah. So, um, so it, it, after I thought about it for a while, I thought, well, it's probably me. It's probably something I should assign myself. Yeah. And um, because I'd sung nighttime songs to all my kids up to that point, yeah. there had my fourth child coming along and I was inspired to make something that would be that would fill that void. And, um, and where was I going with that? The, I think just, oh, and, and at the same time, I got the idea for a new verse to, to House of Pooh Corner, right, absolutely. which, which I wrote about my child, the, imagining what it would be like to have my fourth child. And so I renamed the song Return to Pooh Corner. Yeah. And once I got that name, I went, oh, this is definitely the name of an album. So I, I called that my first children's album. It's really not a children's album. It, although children love it, it's right. a parent's album. Yeah. And, and there's and no parents, parents records. Us parents appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, 
uh, I have the theme song to Paw Patrol forever imprinted on my brain. And, uh, uh-huh. I, you know, I need some things to overwrite that. And you are special. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, no, it's really cool. And uh, I think um, that's, you know, the book is full of those things that where things come full circle. And I yeah. think that, that really uh, uh, drives it home. Um Again, if you would like to purchase a uh, copy that is signed by Kenny Loggins, of the book by Kenny Loggins, still all right, <clears throat> premiercollectibles.com backslash, I think it's a backslash, all right. <clears throat> it is a forward slash. Is it a forward slash? That's going to be a problem. <laughs> people, know, people don't know where that is on the keyboard. No. Um, uh, uh, it has just been tremendous uh, fun to sit here and talk with you. And uh, it's it's a lot like the conversations we got to have on the phone with no one listening in. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but I don't mind doing it with people listening in because I know your fans are just uh, excited to read this book, to have a signed copy, and to uh, see you perform if they're lucky enough to do that. And we just can't thank you enough for such a great book and for opening up and yeah. telling these stories. And, uh, and thank you for encouraging me to write it because I absolutely. was afraid of it at first. And I was afraid of how much I would remember. It is uh, writing a book is a extreme task. It's a daunting uh, task. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Uh, so congratulations thank uh, you. on the publication and uh, just really excited to get it out there. Thank you. So, hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.